Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gabrowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, you know that we have been diving deep into conservation. So we've been talking to scientists and explorers uh, from all over the world who are not only protecting habitats, but also the species uh, within them. Now, before we meet our guest for today, I want to take a quick moment and share National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive uh, so we can get a feel for where everybody is joining us from today. So here we go. My screen should be sharing now. And I'm going to bring that map up to the front. So I am here in Canada. I am in Alora, Ontario at that red X. And if we start to back up a little bit, we're going to start to see where some of our classrooms are joining us from today. So you can see we have a couple classes joining us in Michigan. If I back up a little bit more, we've got classrooms joining us in Tennessee, in Oklahoma, a couple classes joining us in Texas. We've got a classroom joining us in California. And if we back up a little bit more and head across the Pacific a little bit, we can find where our guest Whitney's joining us. So I'm going to zoom in on Hawaii a little bit. You can see I chose a coral image to represent roughly where Whitney's joining us from today. So as I come back from that screen share, I want to give a quick shout out to any classrooms who are tuning in live via YouTube today. You can still get in on the action on the right side of the screen. There's a chat sidebar. Let us know where you're watching from uh, and send in some questions. We'll work some of those in. And any classrooms, whether you're watching us on YouTube, whether you're here live on camera, take some pictures, share them on Twitter, Use the hashtag explore classroom tag at Nat Geo Education because we love to see uh, classrooms in action. All right, on to the main event. So today we have Whitney Goodall joining us. She's a marine ecologist and geospatial analyst who has been working with National Geographic's pristine seas team, assisting the science team's efforts to document the biological communities of the world's pristine ocean ecosystems. She has also been involved in National Geographic's Exploration Technology Lab, analyzing deep sea biological data from drop camera footage in an effort to build a better understanding of what drives the distribution of life in our oceans. She also conducts ongoing research off the coast of Mozambique, investigating a variety of things, including the habitats, the local fisheries, tourism, and how to manage all of these things. So Whitney, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about your work. And of course, let the classrooms fire away with some questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. I'm so excited to, to be speaking with all of you today and to see all these classrooms. It's really exciting to see classrooms um, all over the map, but particularly far away from the oceans. We have um, some classes that are kind of in, in the middle of a lot of land. And so I'm really excited to, to share, you know, this ocean world with you guys. I don't know how much you get to see the ocean firsthand, but hopefully I can kind of show you my window of it um, and, and share that passion with some of you. And then maybe you can follow this path too and make your way out to the ocean. So yeah, thank you so much, Joe. Um, so sh should I just go ahead and, and get started then? Or? Yeah, let's do it. Let's jump right in. All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can see some fun photos. Um, but uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, oops. Let's see. Are you seeing the the um, slides, Joe, or is it swapped on the... Sometimes it doesn't kick in right away. Uh, try hitting the share screen, choosing the whole screen, and hopefully that'll get it going for us. Let's swap the displays here. How about that? Nothing yet. We might just have to start right from the beginning with the screen share. Okay. It can be tricky sometimes if it's a dual, uh, dual screens, but we got it the other day, so I'm sure we can get it today. Yeah. Try this again. We got it yesterday. That looks promising. I see me. Beyond. Okay. And let's give you that one. How are we doing now? Beautiful. Full screen and ready. All right. There we go. So, yeah. So, I am really excited to talk to you guys today about the ocean. Um, and to kind of share my stoke about it, to share my excitement, because it's pretty amazing. Um, and it's amazing all over. I mean, from the seashore all the way down to the seafloor, we're gonna, or today we're gonna talk about 
the whole thing, you know, the shallow areas, the deep areas, all of it. It all matters. Um, so I will start out um, by talking about, you know, what what leads somebody to want to study the ocean? Why why study it? Um, there's there's a lot of answers for this. Um, the a very easy first answer is that you know if, when a marine researcher tells somebody, please step into my office, they're talking about places like this. You know, this is our office view. This is this is what we get to work in. Um, so that in and of itself is pretty inspiring. It's you know it's exciting to look up and be like, this is where I'm working, whether it's in the water or on top of the water. You know, this is what inspires us, um, and hopefully this is what inspires some of you. Um, a lot of my colleagues, you know, if you ask them, did, you know, when did you, what made you want to be a marine biologist or marine research researcher? How long did you know? So many people that I work with can say, I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to be studying the ocean. And I think that's super exciting to know, you know, your whole life that that's what you want to do. Um, I didn't. I didn't always know that I wanted to study the ocean, but I always loved being outside. You know, I loved, I loved being out in nature and just thinking about how all the different systems work together um, or all the different parts of the system work together. And, you know, and that's really what, what drove me from the beginning. So, um, actually a funny story, when I was five years old, um, my family came, I didn't grow up in Hawaii, but my family came to Hawaii when I was five years old um, on a family trip. And the whole family was going out to snorkel. So they were gonna go out, um, you know, and actually look at fish underwater and swim around. And I told them I had no interest in doing that. <laughs> I told them I didn't wanna go snorkeling. I just wanted to stay in the pool and um, and that was fine with me. And, you know, the, the ocean to me then was, it was unknown, it was scary. I didn't know it was underneath the water, um, under, underneath the surface. And so I just thought, no, I'm not gonna go there. Um, obviously things changed a little bit, um, but, you know, I, I still had that excitement about, about the outdoors. So I actually started all of my work on land. Um, a lot of my early experience was studying things everywhere from like a tiny butterfly in one prairie to entire forest ecosystems in national parks. Um, so I got a lot of experience in the field, um, you know, learning about ecosystems. That's really my thing is at the system level. How is everything connected? How is everything working together? When you change one part of a system, how does it affect the other parts of the system? And so my experience on land, um, you know, it's actually really when you when you learn the science and you learn the methods of how to study an ecosystem, it really translates quite well between land and the ocean. So then later, when I dove on the Great Barrier Reef for the very first time, my eyes were opened to this totally new world. I'd never seen anything like this stuff. I mean, all the colors, all the fish, just everything was alive down there. It was amazing. And, you know, this really planted the seed for me of this, this is a very special ecosystem. This is a special place and it's a great office. So I kind of started shifting my, path towards the ocean. Um, but fortunately, it those concepts that I learned on land, they apply in the ocean as well. So, um, you know, so like I mentioned, a lot of the, the methods that we use to study an ecosystem, they're very similar. So when we talk about studying the ocean, um, there's a lot of different methods that can be applied. So one of the common um, ways of studying the ocean that I do is doing underwater surveys. Um, so this is, you know, in the water, whether it's snorkeling or diving, but you know, you are you are in the water and you're surveying what's there, you know, who's living there, 
how many there are, where they are. Um, and so one of the common survey methods is um, doing a transect. So on those left photos, you see that there's a line. We've, we've got this tape um, that we're laying out underwater. And essentially what we're doing there is we're laying out a line that we're gonna do a survey along. Um, so it's gonna be a fixed length that we're gonna that we're gonna swim along and survey everything that's there. So if you picture, if you picture like swimming down a hallway, that's kind of how you you do a survey underwater is you make this imaginary hallway of a fixed width and you swim down that hallway and anything that's in the hallway you count, you count it, you identify it. Um, you know, we even, we even estimate the sizes of fish. Um, so you swim down that line and you take a bunch of data on everything that's in that hallway. Um, you know, and you can imagine when you have a lot of fish in one area, that can actually be pretty challenging. You've got to quick all of a sudden count all these fish, you know, know their names, know how, figure out how big they are. Um, so it takes takes a lot of practice. Um, another thing that we do underwater is taking data on the benthos, on what's living on the, the bottom, the seafloor. Um, so in the bottom right there, that's one method that can be used to quantify um, how much of something is living there. So like how, what percentage of that little sample square that we have there. What percentage of that is coral, like down in the bottom right there? What percentage of that is algae, those dark brown patches? What percentage of that is rock? Um, you know, so these kinds of data, we can, we can actually quantify what's there. And so in surveys like this, hopefully, if you're in a place that is a healthy ecosystem, um, you know, it's intact, it's doing well, Hopefully you're seeing things like a lot of fish, you know, a lot of abundance, or you're seeing important species that play a very important role in the ecosystem, or you're seeing species that are indicators of a healthy ecosystem. So take sharks, for example, they are top predators. So they eat all the fish that are lower than them in the food web. Um, so obviously you need to have fish in order to have sharks around. You need to have food for them. Um, so if you see a shark around, that's a pretty good indication that there's probably food there. There's probably other fish. Um, so when we think about a, an ecosystem, in, in my mind, we're not just talking about the system in that one reef or that one area. We're talking about whole system you know this earth is connected everything that happens on this earth affects other parts of the earth so in traditional hawaiian um, resource management you know they they were sharp they really had this good understanding that it's all everything that you do affects another part of the system so so when here in hawaii when people talk about mauka to makai they're talking about from the mountains to the sea, everything is connected. So when you do something up in the mountains, that's gonna make its way down to the ocean. It's gonna, it's gonna affect things. It's going to affect the fish and the resources that you get out of the ocean. Um, so I really like this concept of, you know, remembering that everything is connected, picturing the, the system as a whole, um, but I also kind of want to, you know, take it all the way, extend it all the way to the deep sea. You know, if we're talking about the earth, the, the whole earth is connected. And so it's not just the mountains to the nearby reef. We're talking about the mountains all the way to the deep sea. Everything matters to everything else, right? So... When we talk about the deep sea, what are we talking about? There's a lot, there's a lot of deep sea. So, you know, the work that I was talking about earlier with, um, you know, that I've done in coral reefs and in coastal ecosystems, with scuba diving and snorkeling, all of that happens on the very top layer of the ocean, very shallow. 
um, you know, near to shore, shallow depths. And, and that's just the very top layer. And there's so much more ocean. So when you move down in the ocean, you start getting into the, the mesopelagic, which is, you know, it starts getting a little bit darker there. It's kind of the twilight zone. You get through there, you get into the bathial zone or the bathypelagic zone. And in this area, this part of the deep sea, you know, you really start getting limited light. So limited photosynthesis. You've got, um, you know, not a lot of nutrients, not a lot of oxygen. Um, this starts becoming a very different system. You go even deeper than that into the abyssal zone and it's dark down there. This is like the bottom of the ocean basins, right? So it's dark, it's cold. The animals down there are very different than the animals that we see up here. You know, it's very, it's like a whole different planet. You know, it's often um, commented that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the bottom of the ocean. Um, so this is just a, this very different world down here. Um, and there's a lot of it. There's a lot of deep sea. So, you know, most of the ocean research to date um, has been done in the, these shallow areas, but that, that doesn't represent a lot of the world spatially. So if we look at the world, let's first start with the bathypelagic zone, that midnight zone. Um, if we look at a map here in blue, these are all the areas that are the bathyal zone. And that's a lot of the world. That's a lot of the ocean that, that you know, there's not, there's not a lot of research done there so far. So, you know, that's a lot of new area to explore. And then when we take it one step further into the abyssal zone, that, that really deep zone, that's a lot. Here in orange is the abyssal zone. That's most of the ocean that we're talking about. That's, that's you know, deep. Um, so there's really, there's really so much left to be known about our own Earth. Um, so I've been working with National Geographic and um, their Exploration Technology Lab to explore the deep sea and to figure out how we can, we can collect data on this area that's so difficult to get to. So the way that we're doing that is um, with cameras. You know, it's too deep to go scuba diving down there. So we can send these cameras. Um, they're like kind of like basketballs. They've got cameras inside this this ball and we throw them into the ocean. They go down to the bottom of the ocean and they sit there with a the weight. And, um, you know, they stay down there for hours and basically they, they film everything there. They just sit in one place and they film anything that comes by. And uh, you can imagine there's some really cool alien kind of stuff down there. And after a few hours, it's programmed to come back up to the surface. So the camera pops back up to the surface. It sends out a signal um, so that we can go find it. It says, hey, please come pick me up. I've got lots of cool video to share with you. And then we go out and we pick it back up. We bring it aboard and then we get to look at all that video. Um, so I have a, a fun, quick little cartoon that um, colleague Nia Beckler from the Nautilus Exploration Program, she made this um, when she was on a ship with these um, with these drop cams, and it's a fun little thing just to kind of show you a day in the life of a Nat Geo drop cam. So this is this is kind of what happens when we send out um, these cameras. Restarted. <laughs> so thank you so much, Nia, for sharing that. It's such a fun, a fun little way of just showing, you know. This is what happens. We, we take these cameras out, we throw them overboard, they go get to see cool stuff at the bottom of the ocean, we pick it up, and then we have data. So we've done this in a lot of parts of the world so far. Um, 
So these are all the places so far that we have uh, camera footage, video footage from, from the seafloor. Um, so we're doing pretty good, but you can also see there's still a lot of ocean to be explored. Um, so when we, when we get this kind of video footage, what we do is we start identifying species. We kind of get estimates of relative abundance. Um, we can, you know, we can look at what's living where and how abundant is it in one place compared to another place. But also we can start looking at patterns, spatial patterns. So you can start overlapping it with other kinds of information, other kinds of data. So like this is, um, this map is showing all the different colors are different uh, sort of habitat features, geomorphic features. And so you can start looking at, okay, if there's a lot of this animal in this one place, you know, is that related to this kind of habitat? And by answering those kinds of questions, you can start looking at, can we predict where an animal might be? If we know the habitat in one area and we know that that animal usually occurs in that kind of a habitat, then you can start looking at, okay, well, we don't actually have footage from this part of the world, but we can we know that there's that habitat there. So we can actually predict that we might expect there to be that animal over there. And so it, it really starts getting into some cool stuff as far as comparing these, looking at these patterns and figuring out where something might be and where it might not be. Um, and then also looking at changes over time. So there's there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this kind of information. Um, but we don't do it just to do it, right? Like, why does it matter? Why should we study it? Why does the deep sea matter? It's far away from us. We don't ever see it, really. You know, most of us don't ever go to the deep sea. And so, um, so does it matter? Well, yeah, that brings us back to everything is connected. Everything's part of a system. So not only does the deep sea matter for biodiversity, you know, there's species living there that don't live anywhere else, but we're also talking about food webs, energy production, you know, nutrient cycling, all of these things, they're all connected. And, and it matters to us at the coastal areas. And that also matters to people inland as well. I mean, if anybody living inland has eaten fish before, um, you know, people in Tennessee, I don't know if you've, if you've eaten fish before, but I imagine some of you have. That's coming from, you know, to you from the ocean. So everything is connected. Humans are part of the system no matter where you are. Um, so the deep sea matters for those reasons, but also the deep sea has its threats. It's, you know, it's got a lot of fishing, overfishing sometimes. There's fishing methods that are very destructive to the ocean bottom where they just drag nets along the seafloor and they kind of pull up anything that's on the seafloor and ruin habitats. There's also mining for, um, you know, for valuable resources that are, that are in the seafloor that aren't found easily anywhere else. Um, garbage sinking to the bottom, marine debris, um, climate change as well. You know, climate change is affecting the chemistry and the biology of that upper layer, but everything's connected. So if it's affecting the top surface, the, the top layer of the ocean, it's affecting the deep ocean as well. And it takes a long time for these areas to recover. Um, if you destroy a part of the seafloor, it can take anywhere from decades up to a million years. And that's not an exaggeration, you know, it, it takes a long time to recover. Um, but also a very important thing is that the deep sea is very unknown. And this is important not only for expanding our knowledge and, you know, just learning more, but if we don't know about an area, it's very hard to know how we're destroying it or how we're impacting it. It's hard to protect it if we don't know very much about it. So it's, you know, these are the reasons why really ocean research, whether it's up in the shallows or in the deep, it's very important to get more knowledge about it. Um, and when it comes down to it, you know, humans need the ocean. We need it for economy, for tourism, for food, 
recreation, you know, the ocean supports a lot of communities around the world that really depend on those, those fish that are in their oceans. Um, but I would say that, you know, in, in this day where, like I said, humans are part of the system, um, not only do humans need the ocean, but now the ocean needs humans. It, you know, we really need to be contributing to this effort of, of learning more about it. And, you know, I have colleagues, other ocean researchers that I work with that come from many different backgrounds. So studying the ocean doesn't just mean that you're a biologist or an ecologist that goes out and does these surveys. You know, there are, there are chemists and physicists, but also engineers and software developers that make really important technology and tools like these drop cameras um, so that we can study the ocean. Um, you know, people in media, um, photographers and, and filmmakers, they are communicating the ocean to the rest of the world. Also economists, you know, fisheries matter for money for countries. And so um, the ocean resources equal money. So economists matter in this effort as well. Sociologists studying how people interact with the ocean, um, all of the, and there's so much more. So all of these areas are ways that anybody could be an ocean researcher. Um, and, you know, and so I'm just hoping that there's something that sparks, you know, sparks that passion in some of you that, that will lead you to also, you know, pick some path towards the ocean and, and help out in this very important um, mission to protect the ocean. So with that, I would like to thank all of the classrooms that are involved in this and everybody else listening in. And I'm really excited about, about our conversation now and the questions that you guys have. Um, I will say I put up um, my information for social media here. I am brand new to that. So, <laughs> um, so maybe, you know, I might, it might take a little bit of learning, but maybe some of you guys can reach out to me and, and help me learn that. So um, with that, I think we can uh, can head to some questions. All right, Whitney, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, well, not only your story, but the importance of our oceans and the deep sea in particular. I think that's really important. And like you, you said, we have lots of landlocked classrooms joining in, but um, whether it's the food you eat, the weather patterns, you're still affected by our oceans. So uh, it doesn't matter how far away you are. And I'm here in Alora, Ontario, pretty landlocked. But like you, my first dive was on the Great Barrier Reef. And I've been diving for over a decade now. And it's pretty much my favorite thing to do. So um, you can be landlocked and still enjoy the ocean. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, let's meet some of our classrooms. Let's ask some questions. First, I want to introduce, uh, where did that group go? There they are. Mrs. Bergeron's class is joining us in Jackson, Tennessee. Now, their microphone's not working, but I'm going to click on their mic so they can wave like crazy. There they are. We can see them waving. Hi, guys. Right. <laughs> oh, don't forget to send in some questions via the chat sidebar. I'll keep an eye out for those. But let's jump to one of our classrooms who's here live on camera with us. Let's go to Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're going to go to the Michigan PowerPoint. Uh, some grade three students. Let me get their on. There they are. How are we doing, grade threes? They're going to come around. They're going to have you ready. Are you ready for call you out? We have some questions if you're ready for it. Or should we wait? No, we're ready. Grade threes, okay. we are ready. Stand right here. Okay, here's our first question. Okay, so we have been studying all the plastic that's gone in the ocean. So I'm wondering when you put the cameras in the ocean, how much plastic did you see? That's a great question and a very important, um, important issue right now. So asking about plastic in the ocean and how much do we see down at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so I will say that um, so far, I, I don't believe that we have caught footage at the very bottom of the ocean um, of plastic, but that doesn't mean it's not down there. Um, these cameras are stationary, right? So we drop them in one point in a huge ocean. 
and we're only seeing that area right around it. So, um, so we may not have seen plastic just in those few little points that we've sampled. Um, but I will say that we, while we're out on ships in the middle of the ocean, we do see a lot of plastic up at the surface, you know, and, and that plastic is, is going to eventually make it down to the bottom of the ocean. And it may make it down in very tiny pieces that we wouldn't even see on the camera. Um, but also, um, somewhat recently, uh, it was um, discovered that plastic has been detected, um, not, uh, not necessarily by cameras, but plastic has been detected down in the very deepest parts of the ocean, down at the bottom of trenches. So, you know, we have information that plastic is everywhere. So it's very, it's a very important issue. Um, and that's great that you guys are learning about that and have that in mind because that's, that's something that we really need to think about. Everybody needs to think about. Absolutely. And just to add to that, I was on board the Nautilus uh, last October and got to see the drop cam drop in recoveries, which was pretty cool. Um, but we used ROVs, so remotely operated vehicles like robots. We could steer along the bottom. We did see garbage at the bottom. We saw um, pop cans, paint tins, we saw a big, huge fishing net, which was made a lot of that of plastic. So those things definitely make it down to the bottom. But like Whitney said, with the drop cam, they kind of sit in one spot. So you'd have to drop right on top of something uh, to be able to see it. Yeah. All right, let's jump to another classroom. We'll come back to our grade threes, but let's meet another classroom. Let's go to Mrs. Holden's group. They're in San Antonio, Texas, some grade four students hanging out with us. I'm gonna turn their mic on. How are we doing, Texas? <laughs> All right, who's up? You have a question? I mean, um, yeah. no? Taz, why don't you step over? Um, there's a bunch of different um things that help the ocean, but how big of a difference is it making? Like, that's the, awesome. Like, oh. That's also very quick. So if I heard correctly, you're asking, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things we can do to help the ocean, but how much of a difference does it make? Did I hear you right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, and I would say that um, it, everything that you do can make a huge difference. And here's why. Um, when you, when you do something and you say, oh, I didn't, want that plastic bag at the grocery store and the person behind you says, well, it makes it easier to take it to the car. Why didn't you take a, a plastic bag? And you say, oh, because I don't want that plastic to end up in the ocean. You know, even, even talking to that person, spreading that information, that makes a big difference. Because think about that person then may tell other people. So aside from the fact that you're keeping that plastic bag out of the ocean, you're also spreading that information to other people, and that could go, that could, that could have a huge impact. So I think that everything that you do with the ocean in mind, with conservation in mind, it makes a big difference. It matters. <laughs> Thanks for that question. All right, that's a great question, and it really addresses uh, a myth that small actions don't make a difference, but that couldn't be further from the truth, like you just said, Whitney. Uh, 1,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people all doing small things that adds up really quickly. So you have to be that leader and show other people the, the right way to do things. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see. Mrs. Smith's class, if you wanna turn your microphone on for me. Uh, you guys are in Avalon, Texas, which I'm sure you know. We've got some grade six and grade eight students there. How are we doing, Texas? Hi. 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 All right, we have a question. Javen. How does the camera come back up? <laughs> we got to get it back somehow, right? right? You can't swim down to the bottom for it. So the way the camera comes back up, and this is where the engineers are really important in this, is well, they're important for the whole drop cam, but they've designed it so that um, there's an attachment. Uh, the camera is attached to the weight by this little piece that actually 
corrodes in the water and um and it essentially when that piece breaks then it releases the camera up to the top so it's programmed that one little piece um to to let go and the camera itself is actually buoyant um so as soon as there's no weight attached to it it'll come right back up to the to the surface yeah. all right very cool great question can we ask a second uh, we're going to come back. I want to make sure we get every question and we'll swing back through. We have one more. So they'll come back. All right. I will come back. I promise. Uh, let's see. Mrs. Anderson in Enid, Oklahoma. We got some third graders hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Oklahoma? Good. Good. Okay. Can you hear us? We got gotcha. you. Okay. Roslyn. Okay. How many different kinds of fish are being found with the camera? Uh, Come up here closer, Rosalind. You want me to say? Mm -hmm. How many different types of fish have you found with the cameras? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, how many different kinds of fish? Hmm. I, let's see. I would think that we've got probably hmm that's a good question well we've got over a hundred different kinds of fish probably several hundred and the thing is that number is actually still changing because when we look at something it's hard it's really hard to identify some things right away right so we have to then reach out to other people in the field other experts and say do you know what this is do you know what this is and so as more of that information comes in we get you know we get better data um, um but yeah that's a good question how many different kinds are in the ocean well i will say that our sampling so far while it's pretty good and we've gone to a lot of places and we've seen hundreds of species it's only it's still only a small part so there's you know there's there's lots and lots of species that are left to be recorded i think that's what's really exciting too is uh, especially in the deep oceans, there's tons of uh, new species left to be discovered. So it really is a cool field if you want to get into it, that, that biology side of it and and find some of those exciting new species. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Irvine, California this time. We've got some grade fives hanging out with us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, California? <laughs> All right, who's up? Forrest, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay, come on up to the camera. Let's see, um, can you get the light on? Hi, camera. <laughs> Is it ethical for humans to explore and perform activity in deep sea depths? That's also a good question. We're talking about exploration and going to these new places. Is it ethical to go there? Um, well, that's a big question. Um, and I think you have to look at what kinds of things might you be imp impacting. Um, so for us, what we're doing, um, I, I think it's highly ethical. I think it's very important. Um, you know, we're really trying to have very low impact on not only on the ocean but on the people involved as well and so um you know so the practices that we have are definitely um they're they're ethical you know we're, we're getting science with good methods good people good practices um but that's a very important thing to keep in mind with research is you got to make sure that you're not compromising um people or environmental rights right does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great thing about the Pristine Seas team is, is you know, we, we've hosted you guys in different locations around the world. Everyone's very professional and everybody is very cognizant of the fact that um, these are special places. So nothing's taken besides pictures and stuff like that. So everyone's careful to make sure that the, the, the environment's left the same way it was uh, that they found it. So that's pretty important too when you explore somewhere. 
All right. Uh, we do have a class question from our classroom in Tennessee. They sent one in to me here via the chat. And they're wondering, they're landlocked, they're far away in Tennessee. What can they do to help the ocean ecosystem? Uh, there's so much, even from the middle of the country, there's so much you can do. So um, like I mentioned earlier, one, one very powerful thing is um, just talking and spreading that knowledge, right? So like if you guys, you know, you learned some stuff today and if you go somewhere else and you tell your family or your friends about the ocean, then that spreads. They might live near the ocean someday and they'll remember that. Um, so not only knowledge, which I think is a super powerful thing, but also, you know, things that you do inland, decisions that you make impact the ocean. So things like um, your choice of seafood. If you're eating seafood, um, and I'm not, I'm not saying don't eat seafood. I, I love it, and that's why I'm trying to protect it. Um, but you know, some seafood is more sustainable or ocean friendly than others. So if you make those choices, that makes a difference. Also, you know, plastic reduction. Your choices as a consumer, you know, buying a lot of plastic or using a lot of plastic, when that gets moved around, that plastic gets moved around the world, whether it's coming to you or going away from you as garbage, a lot of that ends up in the ocean. So um, that makes a difference as well. And also, um, and this is a big issue, but climate change, you know, that, that is a global issue and decisions that people are making with their lifestyles inland, um, you know, such as driving, you know, small things like driving a car rather than biking, those kinds of things, you know, they're impacting the atmosphere, the atmosphere then impacts the ocean. Um, so just keep in mind, the whole earth is a system. So everything that you do inland also impacts the ocean. All right, we're gonna jump to Wyoming, Michigan this time. Mr. Borz has got some ecology students hanging out with them. Let's get their microphone on. How are we doing, Wyoming? Hello. Hello. Hi, Joe. Hey, Whitney. Hi. Our connection is a little spotty, so you guys sometimes sound like you're futuristic robots. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we've been enjoying the glimpses we've heard. Um, so I actually uh, want to touch on your last point. I have a student that has a question about the last thing you just mentioned. Everybody, so, welcome Seth. Uh, my question. <laughs> this is Seth. Hi, everybody. Uh, my question is: since overall uh, global climate change is decreasing, is that in any way going to affect the ecosystems underwater, deep and shallow? Yep, absolutely. So, climate change is a big issue for ecosystems around the world, including the oceans. So, there are many ways that the ocean will be impacted. Um, one way that, you know, that just comes up right off the top of my mind is um, a ocean, it's ocean acidification. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, but basically it means that the carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere is that carbon is that CO2 is going into the, the ocean at the surface layer and it's changing the chemistry of the surface of our ocean. So the CO2 is actually making the ocean more acidic than it normally would be. And this has big, um, especially for coral reefs, because coral reefs are actually made with, you know, they're formed out of animals that have um, carbonate skeletons and they basically dissolve in acidic water. Um, so this is one example of the way that um, climate change can affect the ocean. All right, so Whitney, uh, we're getting tight towards the end of the hangout, but I know there's a few more questions out there. Do you have a few more minutes if we add in a few more questions? Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, all right, excellent. I know Mrs. Chappelle's class uh, had another question, so let me turn their microphone on again. Go ahead. Have you discovered any new fish this year? Have I discovered any new fish this year? Um, we've definitely caught on camera some species that our team has never seen before. And, um, and it's super exciting. Um, and, you know, in these cases, we kind of look around each other and we're like, okay, none of us know what this is, right? And so, like I said before, then we'll send it out to other people, send it out to experts. Um, so 
there are definitely fish that um, nobody has yet been able to identify. Um, in order to really know if it's a new species, you would actually have to collect that species and, um, you know, kind of really describe it and look at the DNA and look at the um, physiology. And so that's a little bit harder to do with cameras, um, but we've definitely seen things that we don't know what they are. So maybe they are something new. All right. That's an awesome point because you know, discovering a new species isn't just as easy as looking and pointing. Sometimes it takes years uh, of study before you can actually verify that it is a new species. So it's a tricky thing to do, but pretty awesome when uh, everything comes together. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Smith's class, if you want to turn your microphone back on, I know you guys had a follow up. Um, how, how much pressure can the cameras take? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the cameras are actually rated to go down to 6,000 meters, I believe. So, um, so that's, that covers most of the ocean, except for those, those deep trenches. Um, uh, the, as far as the, the pressure, it really, dip, you know, it comes down to that sphere that the cameras are sitting in, right? So that sphere is actually this um, thick layer of, of glass, essentially. Um, and so that's that's designed to take all the pressure so that the cameras inside don't have to worry about the pressure. Um, so yeah, that's another part where the engineering is extremely important because you definitely don't want to throw it to the bottom of the ocean where there's a lot of pressure down there and have it flood your cameras, then you're not going to get any footage. Yeah, I was able to see them putting some together in the workshop downstairs at Nat Geo headquarters in DC, and that is a thick layer of glass that they have to use to withstand that pressure coming in from all uh, of those sides. So six kilometers, that's, that's, that's deep. Yeah. Yeah. Most uh, those, let's uh, see. Mountaintops can fit into the ocean at those depths. All right. Uh, Mrs. Anderson, do you guys have a follow-up? Um, how long does it take for the camera to come back up? Uh, that depends on how deep it is. Um, it comes back up fairly fast, um, but, uh, um, and actually I don't have the, the rates off the top of my head, um, but essentially, you know, if it's released and it's at, um, you know, a medium depth, it'll come back up within, you know, you should, you kind of start looking for it within about 10 minutes. Like you should keep an eye out. It doesn't take half a day to come up. It floats up pretty fast, so yeah. All right, Mrs. Holden's class, do you guys have a follow-up? Do the glass bottles and um, the like soda cans break at the bottom of the ocean from the pressure? That's a good question. So if the glass bottles or soda cans are open, they actually let water inside of it so that there's no difference in pressure from the inside to the outside. So they don't end up breaking because of the pressure because um, it's all even pressure. If it's closed, if uh, something is closed and there's air inside of it and then it's sunk to the bottom of the ocean, that's when you get the difference in pressure from the outside to the inside and that's what's gonna break those, those things. All right, great question. Let's jump back to our class in California again. You guys have another question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Arnav, would you come on up to oh. Um, How do deep sea creatures, deep sea animals control and produce their bioluminescence? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, and that might take some different experts than, than I to answer thoroughly. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily know how they control their bioluminescence. So, um, so you might have to save that question for, for a different person. And you know what? I think that is a really good point to talk about because the, uh, a typical team on expedition at Pristine Seas, you're gonna have a lot of different scientists who specialize in different fields. So no one person can answer everything, but working together as a team that's how you can cover an environment and an ecosystem and 
and yeah. figure it out. So a little homework, a little Google homework for later to jump into yeah. some bioluminescence. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, Mr. Borza's class, do you guys have a follow-up? Looks like you might be transitioning. Uh, uh, yes, our school, our school class just uh, ended actually. So we have one more here that stayed behind with one more question. Uh, yeah, my, my last question is, is there any new technology that's being developed to better observe the bottom of the oceans rather than just dropping a camera all the way down? Like such as like a drone or et cetera? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because yeah, it does seem like we can only do so much with these cameras, right? There's still, there's still a lot more to be done. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of emerging technologies out there. I feel like in many different fields, there's people working towards this idea, right? And I don't actually necessarily know everything that is coming out and emerging, um, but, but yeah, there's, there's um, a lot of technology that's not only being developed to, you know, uh, in situ, like on the bottom of the seafloor, look at it, but also from satellites, um, trying to figure out what can we know about the seafloor um, from above. And that's really tricky, um, but there's, a, there's really smart, brilliant brains working on this question in all different areas. So yeah, there's a lot of technology towards that. All right, and we'll give final go to our class in Tennessee. They sent me a question via um, the text, and they're wondering about maybe prehistoric life in the deep sea, since there's so much that unex it's unexplored. Could there be any surprises like that waiting for us? Ooh, I hope so. I like to think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I can't answer that definitively because we don't know, but. Um, but yeah, you know, everything on the sea floor is, um, you know, it's so distant and far away and everything moves really slowly down there. Life is different. So, you know, so there may be things down there that, that you know, have existed for a lot longer than, than humans have and a lot longer than we can even really imagine, um, you know, maybe back to the dinosaurs time. So, um, yeah, I like to, to, to say yes, because because it's fun to think about the mysteries of the deep sea. <laughs> Absolutely. And some classrooms may have heard about a fish called the seal can, and they're found off the coast of Africa, uh, thought to be extinct for a long, long time, a really prehistoric fish. But, you know, recently within the last, however, what is it, about a decade or so, uh, they discovered that they are still alive. So who knows what could be in the deep seas. And that's why we need to explore to answer questions like that but also yeah. questions about things like climate change and food and biodiversity. So the deep sea is a pretty exciting place. Yeah. <laughs> all right, very cool. Well, first of all, classrooms, as per usual, thank you for spending some time with us. Your questions were awesome. And Whitney, of course, thank you for taking some time from the start of your day uh, to hang out with us. And uh, yeah, you're doing exciting work. You get to see places very few people get to see uh, and then share those with the world. So thanks so much for doing what you do. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you all the classrooms too. It was so fun hanging out with you. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna turn all the mics on. Boys and girls, if you wanna get nice and loud, goodbye and thank you, then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. <laughs> Excellent work. You guys are professionals at that. Whitney, again, thank you so much. We look forward to our next Explorer Classroom. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have you on in the future. So thanks, Whitney. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, see everybody. Bye.